profit. Uh, it's partly driven by protection of people, and these, these things can all be good. I'm not saying they're all bad, I'm just saying that there are these conflicting forces. Uh, at the government level, it's also driven to a large extent by worries about terrorism and so on, and, and security at that level, and these are all, these are all legitimate. Uh, whether it's legitimate to use it to the extent it is being used is another matter, but they certainly are considerations that have to be taken into account. That's right. The, the checks and balances have to be there. I suppose that mm -hmm. uh, a, a fairly powerful argument could be made that too much surveillance would be a threat to democracy and therefore uh, would be a threat to society more than allowing for there to be less surveillance and a little more risk of say a car being stolen or something like that. That's right. Um, one of the things that I've been doing a bit of work on in recent times is looking at some other consequences of monitoring and surveillance. Um, most of the worries about it at this stage have been in the, in the literature anyway connected with privacy and lack of autonomy and so on. Um, or particularly privacy uh, and the dangers that um, come from lack of it. The, I think there is also an important issue, particularly if it's surveillance within the workplace or within um, sort of some confined area, if there's monitoring and surveillance, I think it cuts down or reduces the space for trust. Now, some people might think that that doesn't really matter much, but the, but the less trust we have in people, the more that that drives monitoring and surveillance itself, um, and that creates extra overhead, extra expense and so on. If you can trust someone, things are much more efficient. Um, if you can't, then there's a lot of overhead in making sure that the person does what they um, are supposed to be doing. I mean, there's a good example of this, I think, in um, that Dr. Zeus story about the lazy down bee who wasn't producing enough honey, so there had to be a watcher, and then, of course, that didn't work, so there had to be a watcher of the watcher, <laughs> and so on. The whole town was, was watching a watcher or watching the bee. Um, there just is a big overhead. Now, in a lot of cases, that's probably justified. In other cases, it's not clear that it is. But another issue, too, apart from the trust one, I think, is that, and this is related to the trust, in situations where we're not trusted, we don't really have the same sort of capacity to, or the same sort of opportunity to develop moral habits and moral virtues which are beneficial. If my employer is watching me all the time, I can never demonstrate that I'm a good, conscientious, honest worker. Because regardless of what I do, the assumption will be that I'm only doing it because I'm being monitored. So I think there's another issue there in monitoring and surveillance beyond the privacy one too that, uh, that deserves some attention. Yeah, that, the last part you said there is a, is a really uh, interesting point that maybe people don't consider. Um, uh, let's take a look at ethics in the case of uh, technology uh, more. Let's go deeper into that. You're the director of the uh, Center of Australian um, uh, Applied Philosophy and Public Policy, so you're right at the center of th these kinds of issues. In Australia, what kind of um, checks and balances do you have? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, what, what area are you talking about? I mean, there are lots of um, different areas where where checks and balances might be might be needed. How, how about maybe general surveillance, uh, like the traffic uh, cameras and the, the sidewalk cameras, or even specific in the workplace too, as you just pointed out. Uh, well, there is there are um, privacy there is privacy legislation um, which governs well various things to do with um, with the 
the extent to which people can be under surveillance uh, or monitored in what they do there. I mean, I'm, I'm not actually an expert in the in the legal side of things, um, but uh, well, take take another case. The um, I mean, sorry, we just before I get away from there, we do have both federally and in each state there are privacy commissioners where this sort of thing is all um, is examined. So uh, people do realise that there are important issues there. Uh, one of the issues that's come up just recently, uh, well, it's not only in Australia, but um, is the issue of free speech on the one hand, particularly online, because that's where most of these things happen these days. Uh, free speech on, on the one hand and giving offence on the other. Um, now, in Australia, we have laws on well against racial vilification, uh, inciting racial hatred, and that sort of thing. Um, so, for example, on a on a website, you can't have um, neo-Nazi material, or you can have it, but it's illegal. Uh, there have been issues now about the extent to which freedom of speech should be limited so as not to give offence to particular groups um, and currently it tends to be largely um, Muslim groups because of various things that have been happening in parts of the world with respect to um, what's taken as being um, you know offensive to uh, to Islam uh, and I let think me, let me ask you let me stop you there because in this particular case, and it's, and it's an interesting case, uh, there, of course there's the, the ethics and the philosophy uh, of, un, of underlying uh, you know, what can be said and what cannot be said, like the limits of free speech, the, the yelling fire in the uh, movie theaters, the, the famous example. But in the case of uh, religious offense, religious offense could be taken by uh, uh, more like a subjective view, like for example, yelling fire in the fi in the movie theater. We know people can get hurt if if there isn't a fire, you know, and so on. But one person could be offended by some something that someone posts on a religious view, and then commit a, a, a heinous crime. It's a quite interesting case. That this recent one. Yeah, look, I agree, and I am not in favour of making these things um, illegal, at least not in most cases. Um, I am in. F I do think that it can be immoral in certain circumstances to do that. I mean, it can also be stupid, but I think it can be immoral. I don't think. While one might have a right to say pretty well anything you want to about other other religious beliefs and so on. Um, I, don't, I don't think one has a moral right to go around intentionally offending people. Right. Um, so I think, I think there is a difference there. There are certainly behaviours that I think are immoral with respect to giving offence, uh, even though I don't think there should be legislation against it. We had an interesting case here, which wasn't a religious one, but um, the, we have a female Prime Minister and her father died just recently um, and one of the uh, um, radio commentators who is sort of fairly far right um, and, who ha and who dislikes this Prime Minister for various reasons, partly because she's a female, she's single, she's living with a bloke but she's not married and she doesn't have any kids and she's an atheist. Um, so all of those things together make certain people dislike her intensely. And anyway, he made some very offensive remark about the death of her father just recently, and this was sort of within the last week, um, and that's created a furor here. But again, the free speech thing has come up, um, and, and, um, and I mean, this stuff's all circulated on Twitter and Facebook and so on, that's why it's all relevant to the IT side of things. Um, and yeah, the free 
these spare things come up again and I mean, look, a lot of people are saying, well, he shouldn't have said that, uh, which he clearly shouldn't have, but a lot are saying, well, he's got a right to say it because uh, of freedom of speech. But it seems to me you don't have a right, certainly don't have a moral right to say offensive things to people about the death of a loved one, well, any time, but certainly sort of within a week or two of when it's happened. So there are big, um, big issues here to be discussed, I think. I, I agree on all those points. Um, uh, it, there, there's no moral imperative to offend someone else if there's something they're doing you disagree with. We have a reasonable critical dialogue that can deal with these issues if there happens to be something that we dislike if it's a religion or if it's a person's father or whatever. So the, the need to, to vilify and to, to go so far is, is really it's scary on both sides, I think. And that, that sparks, you know. That's right. I mean, I think that there is an obligation, too, on people not to take offense too, too readily. Um, but on the other hand, there's an obligation on not to go out of one's way <laughs> to offend, or not only to go out, out of one's way, but um, to offend through carelessness. I think we, we do need to be, we have a moral obligation to be a bit careful. That's right. Let me, uh, we're, I think we're running out of time here, let me move on to, to human enhancement nanotechnology. We haven't even really even touched those yet, and these are two of the <clears throat> major areas you're working on. Um, I, I should make a a disclosure here that that John is my uh, dissertation ad, ad, uh, advisor at University of Oslo. Uh, I'm very happy to be studying with you actually. And um, the area that we're working on is <clears throat> looking at nanotechnology related to applications such as medicine or uh, in the case of global warming better energy systems. Uh, you wrote a paper where you argue uh, not that medical systems are not needed, but that the energy systems and the energy issue is, is uh, uh, supersedes it, you know, slightly. So, can you talk a little bit about your uh, work there? Yeah. Look, um, this is an area that obviously um, touches people fairly closely because a we want to be healthy ourselves, and we want. Uh, to have the best medical treatment when anything goes wrong, B, perhaps even more so in the case of our loved ones, we don't want to see them suffer and so on. What worries me though about the general thing of um, sort of putting medical research above pretty well anything else is that unless we do something to have clean energy specifically and um, make sure the environment is good enough for us to live in and produce plenty of food and so on, um, it's going to be pretty pointless keeping people alive for longer because, you know, we might be healthy, very healthy for a short time, but then, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot of people, perhaps in the West we won't in the short term, but plenty of I mean, people will run out of food, the environment will be so bad that, you know, it's all very well to stay alive a bit longer, but you won't have enough to eat, the environment's going to be so bad that you'll probably get sick and die of something else. So um, I think that together with all of this emphasis on improving health, we badly need to look at environmental issues and clean energy issues as well because we aren't only healthy because we don't have disease. We can only be healthy and happy, I mean, if our environment is conducive to that. 